I'm uh, particularly glad to welcome you this evening to a return visit by Oliver Letwin. Um, I'm, I'm delighted that um, the Institute for Government has been one of the favourite locations for, for Oliver to uh, make his public speeches during his period um, as Minister for Government Policy at the Cabinet Office. Most of what he does is behind the scenes, but he's made some very interesting speeches here, um, um, notably um, on the role of the civil service, um, which provoked a lively exchange with the Chairman of the Public Administration Committee, um, but in particular because a lot of the, what the Institute for Government does is about the machinery of government trying to improve effectiveness. And what I've been trying to look at as we come to the end of the Parliament is what does this mean for the role of the state as a whole? Because I think some very interesting questions, not just about how efficient government is, but as the cumulative changes which we've seen um, since 2010 and also many before then, what do they mean for the uh, role of the state? Because curiously, I think a lot of things become rather piecemeal. We've had big changes um, in health, we've had changes which are now developing um, with the universal credit, we have changes in education of various kinds, but what does this mean compared with the view of the state um, we'd have had uh, 40, 50, even during the Thatcher era where Oliver played a, a prominent role in, in number 10, um, because it has developed and that we need, we're now in a perfect position a year ahead of the election to stand back a bit and to look at the, um, the changing role of government, and in particular, one of the debates, which I think may be difficult to tease out over the year up to the election, will be what may happen in future to the state and, and the role of government. Because it's quite clear that um, public spending austerity will continue. Um, no one disputes that. Um, but what, again, does that mean for the expectations about what the state can do? Um, it's, I, I was at one department earlier this afternoon who were discussing their um, uh, allocation of staffing and I said that's fine but what happens when you have another uh, request for 10, 15, 20% cuts? Um, what does that mean for what, what you can actually do? And it's pretty fundamental um, in relation to that department. And, and so I can't think of anyone better to reflect on that than Oliver Letwin um, um, over now a considerable period of time, he's one of the most influential conservative thinkers about the state. He's also been very influential, indeed he, he did this here um, last summer, in the change in the, in the way policy is made um, in Whitehall, um, the internal <coughs> review of policy where um, Jill Rutter, my colleague, has played a, a prominent role in producing ideas, and uh, Chris Wormald, the head of the policy profession within Whitehall, and Oliver Letwin as the Minister for Policy, are now taking forward. And I think there's underappreciation more widely because of the focus on individual um, disputes in policy areas um, of the changes in the policy debate and what that means for the state. And we, we want to tease out a lot of this in the period before the election. So I'm actually delighted to wel welcome and welcome back Oliver Letwin to the Institute for Government and to, to hear his reflections. Then I'll um, have some questions to him and we'll open it out for a, a broader Q&A. Oliver. Um, I'm pressing this so that I discover when I'm meant to stop speaking and start, uh, start discussing. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, I, uh, um, I feel slightly like one of those examinees who's uh, warned never to um, accept the implication of a question um, by, by uh, cunning tutors, because um, I'm not really going to answer the very interesting <laughs> questions that you've, Yet, anyway. uh, yeah. you've just posed. Um, uh, uh, but, um, but maybe as we, as we talk, um, um, after I've spoken, uh, some things will come out. Um, uh, I wanted to offer something which is very far from a speech, uh, but is a set of um, observations, um, uh, and which emerge from, from my experience of the last four years, um, and which may very well um, be things which, when you've heard them, you will wish you didn't um, bother to have come to hear. Um, but, um, uh, but anyway, they're my thoughts for what they're worth or not worth. Um, uh, the, the first point I'd make is that this, this is a government which came into being as a, as a coalition um, against the background of a very urgent uh, economic and fiscal need. Uh, a, 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 I think one could accurately describe it as a crisis in 2010. Um, and it was a government that was conceived... Uh, with a very specific uh, purpose, which was to find a way for the country out of 
uh, that crisis. Uh, and uh, with a very specific uh, idea of how to do that, um, uh, which was to formulate and then stick like glue to a long-term economic plan, one that came under enormously uh, strong criticism and skepticism uh, after a couple of years, and which was widely described by uh, many people as being uh, uh, sure to fail, and uh, which I think has uh, begun to succeed. Um, but uh, whether success or failure uh, is your view of it, uh, that was the purpose. Um, the overwhelming, overriding purpose of this government to have and to carry through a long-term economic plan to rescue the country from an economic and fiscal crisis. Uh, and a financial crisis, too. Um, now, if you ask what, therefore, has been the role of the state in the last uh, four years, the overwhelmingly most important role of the state has been to do exactly that. Um, and I don't think that there's anything very surprising or unusual in that, uh, because um, I suspect that if most people had been asked at any time in the last uh, 50 or 100 years um, what the prime duty of the uh, state was at a time when uh, the country was not under physical attack from uh, foreign enemies, um, uh, when we weren't engaged in a, in a world war or something of that sort, I think they would have said that at, at a time of peace, the prime responsibility of the state was to manage the economy appropriately. And obviously, the, the degree to which that becomes the overriding uh, preoccupation depends on the uh, facts of the matter, just how bad the situation is when you start, uh, determines just how much of your focus is on resolving that situation. Our situation in 2010 as a country is very bad indeed, therefore our focus was very remorselessly on this, and the long-term economic plan was our answer, and uh, uh, I think it's very natural that the role of the state should primarily have been to try to rescue us from this crisis, to do what the state can do. Now, uh, I could at that stage, I suppose, um, spend the, the, the next uh, 16 minutes uh, describing that long-term economic plan and um, explaining why the role of the state is as it has been in that plan. And obviously, I'm very happy to uh, discuss um, aspects of that if you, if you want to raise that afterwards. But um, uh, first of all, if you really wanted to do that, you should really have asked George Osborne rather than me to, to come and talk to you. And, and um, secondly, I suspect that there are many people in this room who are, uh, I know one or two, definitely, who are extraordinarily well-versed in that already and would be very bored if I were to go into the uh, detail of it. Um, uh, so I, I, I want to reflect on the role of the state uh, at a time when the preoccupation has been with the long-term economic plan, but I don't intend to speak uh, specifically about... Uh, funding for lending or the fiscal austerity or the efforts that have been made to uh, arrange uh, a, a much greater attention to uh, science and technology transfer or exports or uh, the loosening of the supply side of the economy or all the other many things that all of us in government have been very preoccupied with over the past few years, both at, at the supply side of the economy and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the part of the macroeconomic uh, governments of this country, which goes on in government as opposed to the Bank of England. Um, moving away from the centre of all that, one component of our long-term economic plan uh, from the very beginning was to uh, try to improve the productivity, efficiency and effectiveness of the public services. And this was a critical uh, component of the plan um, partly for fiscal reasons. It's quite inconceivable in a democracy where uh, the population um, very understandably and rightly demands high-quality public services that if you have very much less money than you used to have because uh, in the ineffable phrase of the former Labour Chief Secretary, the money's run out, uh, then you have to find ways of getting more for less from the public services in order to sustain the demands of the population for those services against that background. 
Uh, and so um, uh, there's no doubt at all that a very, very large part of our attention needed to be focused and has been focused as part of that long-term economic plan on the uh, improvement of the public services. And some years back, I think about a year or two before 2010, I was in fact in this room speaking to a large number of, I think mainly at that time, senior civil servants. Um, uh, I remember seeing Gus O'Donnell and um, Andrew Turnbull, sort of there-ish. Um, uh, about uh, what were then, of course, this is pre-coalition, our conservative plans for the reform of public services. And those broadly were carried into government. And uh, I explained at that time what we've stuck with, which is a, 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 a layering, um, a, an understanding of some services as being principally individual services where we hoped to achieve and have tried to achieve uh, significant improvements by um, increasing the degree of uh, individual choice and the accountability of the service providers to the choices made by individuals. Secondly, communal services, community services, where we've tried to, uh, as we said we would, uh, devolve a very significantly power over those services to much lower levels, including, uh, uh, wherever possible, um, neighbourhoods uh, or uh, community groups. Um, uh, triumphantly uh, uh, um, shown, for example, in the spread of neighbourhood planning. Um, uh, again, very happy to talk about those things uh, uh, later if you wish. And, and then a third group of services where uh, we determined that the, uh, the users were so uh, vulnerable as not to be able to make the kinds of choices which in individual services people can make. So, for example, those who are drug addicts, those who are suffering from uh, 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 very prolonged uh, uh, medical conditions in old age, and so on and so forth. And we tried to find, uh, in those kinds of cases, um, uh, methods of accountability and of getting more for less, which have more to do with uh, innovative procurement and uh, payment by results and social impact bonds and a whole um, panoply of other uh, methods. Um, so the second role of the state in the last four years has been to reform the public services to try to get more for less in a way that's consistent with the long-term economic plan and indeed a necessary component of achieving that plan in a way that's democratically acceptable. Uh, and um, uh, as I said, I'd be very happy to talk about those things too if you want to afterwards. But, but again, there will be people in this room that are very, very familiar with all of that. And uh, I don't think there's anything either contentious or unusual about the proposition that one of the roles of the state is to ensure that it provides services uh, uh, as good as possible for as little a call on the taxpayer or on lenders to the taxpayer as possible. Having said which, it has to be admitted that for a very long period before that, uh, uh, that uh, seems to have been largely overlooked in practice. Uh, there was a gargantuan waste and inefficiency and very little serious effort to reform in some areas, though in others, of course, people have been making efforts for many years. However, it isn't that either that I wanted to uh, focus on um, this evening, um, uh, because, as I say, I think um, that's, that's pretty much um, something that's familiar to all the people uh, in this room. Um, When one looks at, at, at everything that's happened in the last four years, I think there's a, a, a different thing which was also uh, going on and which I think is less familiar and which is also very deeply uh, part of the long-term economic plan but I think has been much less discussed and much less explored. Um, and to explain this, I think I need to step back a moment um, and say something about uh, the movement of ideas over the last um, uh, few decades. Um, uh, uh, I'm old enough, alas, um, to uh, remember a time when the big debates in um, uh, not just British politics, but uh, politics around the world, were debates between um, uh, Marxism and its uh, cognate uh, ideologies and um, uh, capitalism, uh, free market economics. 
Um, and uh, you referred to the 80s. I found myself as a minor apparatchik, um, uh, part of one of the great efforts to shift the center ground. Everybody in this room is entirely familiar with the degree to which uh, in the later part of the 20th century uh, there was a huge shift in that ground. And as I would see it in any case, um, uh, broadly um, around the world, from the uh, Chinese Communist Party to uh, the British Conservative Party, we liberated ourselves, or indeed the British Labour Party, we liberated ourselves from this absurd uh, debate, and uh, um, uh, Marxism lost its uh, hold on the imagination and its uh, cognate ideologies largely disappeared, and um, we moved into a much more rational mode of discussing how to manage uh, a society in which uh, there were free markets, uh, but there were also certain social and uh, environmental goals. Um, now, um, <coughs> it's an interesting reflection, which is, well, I think it's interesting anyway, come upon me more in the last four years than I had expected, that the, the end of that a rather sterile debate between, in my view, lunacy and rationality, and the onset of a sort of general consensus in favor of rationality and then debates around it, left us with a different um, uh, uh, dichotomy, choice, set of alternatives, however you describe it. Um, and that <coughs> was a choice not between um, uh, ownership of the means of production by uh, the uh, state on behalf of the uh, proletariat or whatever the previous language was and capitalism or free markets, but rather a choice between um, what was presented in any case as on the one side something close to anyway laissez-faire and on the other side regulation. Um, and, uh, and reading back now, I don't know if other people have done this, it, uh, the, 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 um, the debates of the last uh, 20 or 30 years in this country and in many others around the world, I'm very struck by the extent to which that debate between regulation uh, uh, on the one side and uh, leaving the markets to themselves on the other side seems to have dominated a large part of political discourse. Um, and I think one of the most remarkable things about the last four years is the extent to which we have begun to reimagine our way out of that sterile debate too. Uh, and I don't think that has been very much recognized yet. Um, uh, the, uh, the thesis that uh, there is a choice to be made between regulatory solutions for achieving social and uh, economic and uh, environmental <coughs> goals and free market or laissez-faire open methods that involve no government intervention depends on the hidden presumption that the only way that government can intervene in the operations of uh, uh, free markets and the individual making choices and competition and so on is by regulating. Unless, of course, you move back to the Marxist or crypto-Marxist idiom of um, uh, trying to own the means of production. Um, well, that's uh, false. It's, it's false. It's not true that the only way that government can intervene in uh, the free choices made by citizens, the interplay of markets, the operation of civil society and so on, if it doesn't seek to own everything and run everything, is by regulating everything. I'm going to make a very partisan remark that I think that the current leader of the Labour Party has made the mistake of imagining that that proposition is true, which I think is misleading him into a set of propositions which are unappealing, but, um, but as a matter of fact, it isn't true. Leave aside one's view of value, just as a matter of fact, it isn't the case that that's the only way that governments can intervene without taking ownership. Um, and in fact, I think we've begun to understand and explore 
a whole range of different ways in which government can intervene to try to achieve uh, economic, uh, social and environmental goals uh, which do not involve regulation. And I would describe it as a, a, an important part of the long-term economic plan we've been following over the last four years that we have been consciously deregulatory and simultaneously interventionist. And I remember a time when people would have been standing in places like this assuming without even questioning it that that was an impossible thing to be, that you couldn't be both deregulatory and interventionist. You had to make a choice. Um, now, part of the reason for that is that uh, a new science is with us, uh, which uh, is well known to those who know about it, but is uh, a newcomer in, in political discourse, namely behavioral economics. There's a great deal of very important work that had been done over many years that was very little recognized by those responsible for running countries. In the last four years, we have been enormously uh, uh, investing in a whole series of measures to, uh, to try to achieve on the ground certain kinds of results by doing things other than simply legislating and regulating people into it, which by and large doesn't tend to produce quite the results that the legislators and regulators had in mind. Uh, and... Uh, uh, whether you call it uh, behavioral insights, as in the behavioral insights team, which four years ago I think was taken uh, rather for fun in Whitehall, and which I think now is increasingly seen as an enormously serious endeavor. Um, or whether you talk about it in terms of nudge, which was again at one stage derided, I think now increasingly understood. Um, uh, or whether you talk about convening and gathering together and facilitating uh, uh, one way or another, uh, well, uh, in a whole range of areas, from automotive engineering through to uh, the way that we encourage people to pay their taxes, um, uh, we have been uh, trying out a whole series of ways of getting better results with the activity of government involved but with government not trying to achieve those results by legislating them into existence. And certainly, obviously, not by nationalizing them into existence. Uh, and, uh, and I think that constitutes an enormously significant shift in thinking. Uh, we've yet to see, we're very far from yet seeing, the full range of uh, effects that that shift in thinking can have. Uh, but I'm absolutely convinced that uh, we are learning the ability of governments to influence outcomes for the better in non-regulatory ways, uh, and indeed while simultaneously reducing the amount of regulatory interference. Um, and, uh, and I think that's part of the reason why we've been able to over the last four years significantly improve the supply side of the economy without some of the uh, controversies and uh, social and environmental consequences that would previously have been thought to arise from that. Uh, and I, I end with the thought that, that the paradox which arises from that is that most people haven't noticed it. What most people in this country notice is when there's a row. In fact, the row has to be very big and go on for quite a long while for anyone much in the country to notice anything. Um, and if, if things are done that don't cause much row, uh, most people will never know that they've happened. Uh, I'll give you a very interesting example from the last four years, just a micro example to prove the point. Um, at Cabinet today, Francis Maud presented uh, the astonishing results that have been achieved in mutualizing public services. Um, not a regulatory measure, um, but one that achieves a very significant set of changes in culture and results and efficiency. Uh, most people in this country, I suspect, have never heard of this. 
they don't know it's been happening. And the reason they don't know it's been happening is no one much has been objecting to it. The people who are the employees who become members of the mutual are happy. The people that they're serving are happier because they were previously getting a less good service. The treasury is happy because the costs go down and so no one says boo, so no one gets to hear about it. And I think that's uh, uh, very similar to a whole series of the things that I'm talking about. As the, as the movement of ideas has occurred, and as government has sought to achieve the uh, effectiveness of its long-term economic plan in ways which are not regulatory, but are interventionist, um, uh, through uh, uh, mechanisms that work, try to work with the grain of uh, uh, human behavior, uh, that is largely invisible because it's largely uncontroversial in particular. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't attend to it. Um, and I think it's extremely important if we're to find a way over the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of living in the kind of country we want to live in um, uh, that we should attend to these things and get to the point where we're really very good at doing them and we're just at the beginning of all that, I think, at the moment. Uh, so I see it as an enormously exciting evolution and one that um, I hope, regardless of uh, uh, particular administrations coming and going over the next 50 years, will become more and more seen as the way to go about things. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, uh, Oliver. I, I think I think you you answered part of the, the part of my question. That, that, and that, can I probe you on uh, on other aspects of, for opening it up? Because I, I, I can see a lot of people are interested in asking. Looking at other examples of where this change in approach has already produced results, what, what would you what would you, what would you cite for that? That where and also what is the scope of it? I mean, you know, we. we it, it, you know, we're very familiar here with some of the examples um, of um, behavioural change, nudge, but how, how far can it actually be taken? Well, let me give you um, what I think is the most striking example of all. Um, well, actually, no, before I do, let me give you one which is just sort of simple that may stick in the mind, which is less important, but nevertheless very striking. Um, uh, about six or seven years ago, uh, when uh, my party and I were still in opposition, we came to the conclusion that we could probably have an effect on the degree of accountability and effectiveness of policing if we revealed, made arrangements to reveal to the population uh, where which crimes were being committed. Um, and so we conceived the idea of crime maps. And I remember being told by all sorts of people, very grand people of all sorts, in the newspapers, in the judicial system, in the police and so on, that this was a clearly a complete waste of time and effort because nobody would use these maps. Uh, we now have a system of crime maps. I can't quite remember what the number is. I think about 900 million hits so far. Um, turned out that people are very interested indeed in this question. Um, and the conversations that people now have with their local police officers are quite different because they're actually informed by fact. And if you're a local police officer and the person you're talking to knows what's happened on their street and knows how it compares to the nearby streets, it's much more difficult to pretend away a problem. And that changes the corporate culture in the police. Quite profoundly, I think. Um, so that's one simple, striking example. But and the, the thing I think is, is really most striking is the case of neighbourhood planning. Um, if, if you ask um, what it is that has been the biggest uh, structural defect of the British economy over the last 50 or 70 or 80 years, I, I think a, a very strong contender would be the cycle of uh, boom and bust in asset prices, uh, principally driven by, in a small and crowded island, cycle of boom and bust in housing prices. Why has this occurred? 
uh, it's occurred because um, uh, supply has not uh, matched demand as economies have recovered from the cycle. And uh, as latent demand has crystallized, it's pushed up prices to unsustainable levels. And then uh, the sequel is well known. Uh, what's different this time? Well, what's different this time is that supply is now rising. Why is supply rising? Well, it's rising for all sorts of reasons. Part of it is that in a rather more traditional way, we've taken on various kinds of vested interest so that the, the number of planning permissions, you can read this in the Daily Telegraph, we don't approve it, the number of planning permissions has doubled. Um, and, of course, therefore, the amount of house building is also increasing dramatically from absurdly low levels to more sensible levels as demand is coming through. And I hope that this time around we won't generate uh, that sort of cycle and will instead see uh, supply feeding through into demand. But underneath that, something much more remarkable has happened. Because that's a traditional battle between two sets of people. A government trying to solve an economic problem for the country and enable young people to find housing. And the other side, people sitting in a particular place who don't want to have any more housing around them. Uh, but it doesn't need to be that way. And neighborhood planning, which again we were told no one would take up, there are now about a thousand of them, uh, which are in various stages of progress. Some already, in the, though it's only a couple of years old, some already complete. Neighborhood planning is a process in which the neighborhood comes together, it has to be the whole neighborhood, because in order to succeed in establishing a local development order through a neighborhood plan, you have to get a referendum of the neighborhood. Um, and uh, people said there will nobody be interested in doing it. Well, as I say, a, a thousand sets of people already are interested in doing it. People said no one would turn up. Um, the meetings throughout the country have been totally packed. Uh, uh, people said it would be garnered by a little uh, clique. It can't be, because the referendum prevents it. People said nobody would have the stamina. Well, lots of them have got to the end, uh, or near to the end, and a handful have absolutely finished. Uh, so, you know, all in all, actually what's happening is that it is happening. And what it does is to transform the situation because there is a complete change of the question that's asked. If somebody else is uh, giving permission for some developer to come and descend on your community and build houses, the question you ask is, how can I prevent this? If you're the neighborhood planning your own future, the question you ask is, how can I balance appropriately our desire to see the neighborhood somehow preserve its character and uh, move forward in a sensible way with our desire to make sure that our children and grandchildren have places to live. Um, the most interesting feature of neighborhood planning is that it has actually led to places, in, in many cases, uh, authorizing more houses to be built than would otherwise have been foisted on the neighborhood, um, but with no popular resistance because they're of a type and a kind and follow from a process and a discussion which has involved the people of the neighborhood. Now, that is not a regulatory solution. It's not a Marxist solution. It's not a free market, open, textured solution. It is a solution of a community coming together and a framework being set up which enables them to change the question they're asking. And that, I think, is a very, very, very powerful. Your colleague, Dick Bull, still is being um, attacked by a lot of your backbench colleagues for... Um, I saw that one, one, one uh, MP was saying, uh, I lose my seat because of what you're trying to ah, do. No, interestingly, those attacks are on uh, w what we've rightly been trying to do, mm. in my view, which is, in the meanwhile, as neighbourhood planning is only just starting, mm. to force uh, councils to come up with more uh, houses in their plans. Mm. But, but on the neighbourhood planning, there hasn't been the slightest objection. And in fact, I, I, I won't embarrass people, but mm. I bet very many people in this room, if they don't happen to live in a place where there is a neighbourhood, they don't even know the neighbourhood planning has occurred cause no controversy. It's actually accepted. And it's accepted because it's working with the grain of human nature. Now, within your model, I mean, it, it, where does elected local government or elected local representation fit within this? Well, interestingly, the way that the neighbourhood plan works is that it has to be inaugurated where there is a parish by the parish council. Hmm. But it's a parish council working with the people of the parish, not over them, hmm. because it has to obtain a referendum result in favour of the plan. Where there isn't a parish council, you have to form a neighbourhood forum, and neighbourhood forums we have now provided for neighbourhood forums quite easily to be transformed into parishes. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the effects of all of this is, is that we will see over the country as a whole many, many, many more places in cities that didn't have any parishes actually 
beginning to have their own very local local government uh, to complement larger scale local government. Um, so all, all the trends I was talking about are encapsulated in that one example. Could I just ask a, a, another broader question, which is one of the crucial, I mean, looking further ahead, ageing population, all the familiar aspects of that, expectations of what the state should provide. Have those really changed? I mean, there's been changes in financing some areas, um, obviously in relation to um, elderly care, um, student fees, although there's still a lot of controversy on that. But uh, looking long-term fiscally, haven't you got to alter expectations of what the state actually provides itself as compared with the individual? Because this is a long debate going back to the Thatcher era when you tried to shift some of those burdens. Well, one thing I think has certainly changed, which is the beginning, anyway, of communities much more seeing themselves collectively as having a responsibility to do and provide things uh, for themselves not individually but collectively, but within small communities. That goes alongside neighbourhood planning. Uh, community land trusts, uh, community groups of various kinds, the, the new kinds of powers and rights that we've given to them, uh, the degree to which local government across the country has uh, said to local communities, you want your library to flourish, we want your library to flourish, we don't have the money to plug professional help on the scale it mm. used to be into your library, would you like to come forward and help to run your libraries for yourselves? Mm. People are doing that all over the country. Uh, and I, I picked libraries, but you could pick many, many other things uh, alongside those. Community transport schemes are a very interesting case. Now, this is, this is not a case of someone saying, this service doesn't need to be provided for individuals that are vulnerable. It's on the contrary. Someone saying, this service does need to be provided for individuals, some of whom are vulnerable, for them it particularly needs to be provided, doesn't necessarily need to be provided in the old way. It can be provided at the community level rather than being provided from outside. Um, and that I think is a very, very powerful transformation. Um, uh, and I think there is a, a, an increasing acceptance that very often that is a much more efficient solution. That actually the diseconomies of scale in many cases are very considerable. And moving back if you like, but I would say forward to a world in which things are done at a really micro-local level can very often actually be more efficient than doing them at the macro level, especially if they're linked in the right way with macro support. Now, the under-regulation point, the, the, it's always been the debate is, yes, we want to reduce regulation, but hold on, then a scandal emerges. We've seen it in the health service. We've seen it um, in elderly care, for example, where people expect the state to be, if not the provider, and in many cases, I mean, certainly in, in, in residential homes, it is not the provider. Um, it's a residual funder. But expect who else can do it but the state to provide the guarantee of standards and so Yes, I think this is very interesting. We, we have run alongside the red tape uh, challenge, which has um, looked at 6,000 regulations, removed or improved about 3,000 of them, has uh, hugely diminished the vast piles of guidance in a whole realms of, of public administration uh, and so forth. Alongside that, we've run something called Focus on Enforcement. And what that's looking at is where you do have, and there are areas, of course, where you do need regulation, is it being done in a way which is both effective, maximally effective, and minimally intrusive and bureaucratic? And that's just as important as changing the and diminishing the uh, intrusiveness of the regulations and guidance themselves. Um, uh, and the case you cite is a very interesting one. There was no absence either of legal regulation or of regulators in the health service at the time of mid-staffs. <coughs> um, the problem was that the regulators were spending their time doing all sorts of things other than regulating the thing they were meant to be regulating. And so the regulations, which have no life unless there is a regulator who is imposing them, uh, were not achieving their intended effect. Now, the, uh, the transformation in the CQC is an interesting, Care Quality Commission is an interesting mm. case of something which now actually employs people who know what they're doing to inspect things they know about and to look at the outcomes for patients using things like the friends and families tests mm. and the morbidity and mortality tables to tell objectively whether the thing they're looking at is something they need to look at or whether they ought to leave that one because it's okay and look at something else. 
instead of spending time checking whether the people have the relevant number of NVQs or the documentation of the radiators is right, which I fear is something which was going on in some care homes. So that the, the, the people were being grossly mistreated, but the bureaucracy was measuring bureaucratic uh, measures rather than whether the people were being properly looked after. So uh, my answer to you is not uh, either that um, uh, we don't need regulation of such things, we do, nor that uh, uh, just having the regulation will solve the problem. It has to be the regulation of the right kind, and it has to work in a way which is as close as possible to a deregulatory solution, namely one which encourages the culture of actually producing the results you're trying to produce, which means regulation of a kind which looks at the outcomes and not at the inputs. Just one final thing before I open up. What does this mean for the central state? How does the central state need to be reshaped for what you describe? Well, what we're discovering is that one of the things it means is that the central state can afford to be, indeed needs to be, thinner and more agile. Uh, and it needs to concern itself much more with outcome. And one of the things I'm proudest of in the last few years is the uh, activities of our implementation unit, which is a small group of highly sophisticated officials who spend their time effectively mystery shopping. They go and find out what is actually happening on the ground. I can't tell you what a powerful device that is. Um, you can sit at innumerable meetings in Whitehall and be discussing innumerable things which just have the missing component but nobody around the table knows what is actually happening on the ground. Somebody walks in whom you've commissioned to go and find out what's happening on the ground. It has a transforming effect on the whole discussion. Um, and um, uh, the, the, the refocusing on outcomes very often means that you can then avoid having to do a whole series of things that were occupying a very large amount of time with a very large number of people who were having no effect whatsoever on the outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you do have to ask yourself the question, you know, at a time when, although mercifully there have been one and a half million new private sector jobs and so employment has gone up, we have actually reduced the size of the public sector payroll by around a half a million. Why hasn't there been more complaint? Answer, because we have, we've been focusing on outcomes, and it's the outcomes that generate the complaints. If the outcomes are the same or better, people don't complain about the fact there are fewer people involved in producing. Right, this is a point, I think, to open up. Um, I, 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 could you say who you are? I know who you are, but could you say who you are? And mics, um, have we got some microphones? Yeah, fine, thank, thanks, Kerry. Thank you, I'm Clive Bates, a former civil servant. Um, Conservatives <coughs> came to power with quite a, a radical agenda about the role of the state, and it was called Big Society. Um, could you reflect a bit on what's happened? Uh, what, was, it a, was it a bad and vacuous idea? Were the ideas good but badly branded? Are the ideas good and working but under another name? Can you just sort of fill us in on where that's all headed? Uh, none of the above. Uh, of the above. Most of the things I've just described mm. all fit into that heading. Neighbourhood planning was one of the things that we most advertised as a symptom of a big society. Another was the taking over by communities of responsibility for more of their own services, as I was just talking about. Another was community land trusts and community groups. Another was community powers. Um, another was the mutualisation uh, that I was referring to uh, across the public services. Another was uh, the promotion of uh, payment by outcomes uh, for voluntary sector groups through social investment bonds and uh, an array of, of other social investment techniques, as I was mentioning. All of these were uh, fundamental components of the big society that we proposed um, uh, in deference to our liberal um, uh, colleagues in the coalition. We haven't majored on the phrase, but the idea is exactly what I'm talking about. It's a good idea, and as you say, it's a good idea. It's not only a good idea. Yeah, I I think it's an excellent description of it, and, and uh, I continue to use it frequently, but um, uh, it, I don't really, in the end, care what the description is. What I care about is the progress, and that we have maintained, absolutely. Right. Gentlemen, no, just, just, you, you've got a mic there. Yeah. Uh, Colin Barrow, former leader of Westminster Council. Um, I, one of the more intractable problems that you wrestle with, and social impact ones uh, touch on this, is the relationship between an intervention here and a saving over there. Um, if you educate children better, will they keep out of prison? 
more topically, if you look after older people in their homes, they keep out of hospital. It seems to me that, that there's a long way to go before we're able to spring the saving, the cashable saving, and move it in to the area which is providing the intervention. And I wonder if you might comment on that, particularly in the context of the Better Care Fund. Well, um, as you say, that the, the most poignant and uh, urgent and immediate example of the phenomenon you're describing is in the area of, uh, of care for the elderly and uh, health care for the elderly. Uh, and that is, of course, what the integration of the Better Care Fund, as you're very powerfully aware, is meant to be about. Um, uh, and, you know, in any rational society, and this is not a point of controversy in British politics, I think we would agree across the spectrum, any rational society would obviously want to invest in keeping elderly people um, well and at home rather than ill in hospital or looked after in a residential home they didn't want to be in. Um, uh, and clearly, the saving that accrues from that investment is distributed, whereas the investment is typically in the home and hence had been regarded as a sort of local authority concern. And so the point of the Better Care Fund is to bring together health service resources and local authority resources to invest in something which actually benefits the uh, person primarily, but in addition benefits both local taxpayers in saving on residential care and benefits the NHS in terms of reducing the demand for unplanned admissions and the like. Um, is this process yet complete? Certainly not. Uh, is it underway? Equally certainly yes. Uh, will we, as we go forward, uh, begin to forge new relationships between people who had previously been in isolated uh, satrapies? Uh, I think we will. Um, uh, and will it eventually, uh, by which I mean a year, 18 months later, begin to produce results? And will it, after that, two, three, four years later, produce really very significant results? I think it will. Um, uh, we can't prove that yet, but I'm uh, I would absolutely bet on it. Um, but it's not the only example. Um, and I think we are absolutely uh, um, beginning down a journey where, um, I mean, on, 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 at the starting point of which lie many different uh, areas where we're trying it out. And, and in each case, I see it progressing, though at different speeds. Um, as you say, typically social impact bonds are a, uh, in this space. They, they, are, they are cases in which uh, somebody is putting up some initial money in a field which will save money in some other field. Um, if, if our um, drug rehabilitation services improve, as they have been, not only do we uh, find that life conditions improve for the people who were addicted and dependent, but also uh, Ian Duncan Smith's department reduces its uh, expenditure on welfare and benefits. Uh, um, uh, Jeremy Hunt's department reduces its expenditure on uh, cure uh, because uh, people <coughs> are not so ill. Uh, and um, uh, Theresa May's uh, department doesn't have to spend so much time trying to track down people who are thieving in order to support the drug habit. Uh, and in fact, I think one of the major reasons why crime has been falling is the reduction in the number of people dependent on the most serious uh, drugs. Uh, because each one is a one-person crime wave. Um, the quite small changes uh, in numbers of those addicted have quite big effects on, on uh, crime. Um, so uh, you can't capture all those effects um, uh, in a convenient way in the provider unless you can find a method of funding the provider that anticipates those effects and then pool funds from a set of sources, and that's what we've tried to do. Um, and uh, I think much the same could be said of uh, Chris Grading's Rehabilitation Revolution or the Troubled Families Program that uh, Eric Pickles and Louise Casey have been um, spearheading, bringing together different agencies that are involved in different things, local and central, and getting them to talk to one another and work together and share um, 
uh, and pool funds and resources to try and achieve mutual advantage. Now, as, I, as you say, I think you're absolutely right, we're at the foothills of this. Um, we need to get to the point where we think holistically across the board, you know, what is the saving to the taxpayer, all told? What is the advantage to the person? And if there is an advantage to the person and a saving to the taxpayer, let's do it and not worry about which particular budget it's saving money in. Um, but in order to do that, an awful lot of paddling has to be done under the water. A lot of mechanics have to be set up. And that, I think, we're learning how to do. Right. Um, we, Johnson? Sorry, the mic's coming for you. Thanks. Uh, Jonathan Portis from the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. Um, uh, two quick questions. Um, where do you see the payment by results agenda going? How successful do you think it's been? I mean, the biggest example has been the work program where, frankly, uh, um, and I, I, I make clear that neither of these questions is particularly party political since these are basically continuations of programs of the previous government. But, you know, the work program, much as predicted, has delivered sort of fairly mediocre results because the same providers are doing pretty much the same thing with slightly less money, possibly slightly more efficiently, and getting, as a consequence, as you would expect, roughly the same, possibly slightly worse outcomes. Where do we go from here? And the second is how do your, the, uh, um, uh, uh, these principles apply to services where you know, they're, they're, it, it, you, we are, in some sense, doing something to people rather than for them? Um, the most obvious here is the example of, again, in DWP, is the um, ATOS contract for assessing uh, people first, both the work capability assessment onto IB or ESA and, and also the DLA PIP, where failures of government contracting and contract management, even though we didn't need mystery shoppers to know that it was going horribly wrong on the ground, you and every other MP has people trooping through their constituency offices to tell them this. Um, <coughs> the result is lots of miserable people and as far as I can tell from the last OBR report, at least a couple of billion pounds of savings that have mysteriously vanished. How does the sort of agenda you've described help to address those sorts of problems, which will be the first thing in the in-tray of, of ministers from whatever party uh, um, in 2015? Well, um, so far as the work program is concerned, as a, as a, a sample of, of payment by results, I think actually you're rather behind the times. Um, uh, uh, some of the work program providers uh, for uh, the cohorts that are now coming through who are uh, older, we still have problems with uh, the younger cohorts and in particular <coughs> with those on ESA. That's a very particular problem. But for those on JSA and in particular those who are um, adults on JSA, uh, 21 and over, um, uh, actually the program is beginning to work much, much better. And uh, interestingly, because it has saved a lot of money compared to what it would have paid out if we hadn't been paying by results, has admirably shown the value of a payment by results regime. It's perfectly true that it underperformed in the early years. As it performs better, it will get more expensive, but because it's producing more results. And uh, I think that perfectly illustrates why it is worth doing it that way. And because it is uh, a, a market that involves a series of providers, it's possible to start removing from the scene those providers that are underperforming and uh, tightening the screws on those that are performing less well and enlarging the scope of action of those who are performing best. So uh, uh, it would be interesting to have this conversation again five years from now. I suspect that whoever is the next government will actually continue the program. And I suspect that by then it will be a uh, roaring success rather than as it is now improving significantly, but it will also en route have saved money very significantly compared to what would have been the situation if it had just paid for the inputs and waited to see what happened. So I, I don't think that that is something that's likely to be on the in trays of the new government as something needing massive change. I think it's something which is work in progress and is working pretty well. I do agree that uh, the ATOS assessments of the um, PIP, uh, for example, have, have not at all been successful. And the truth is that I think when government contracts, it always has the question where it isn't contracting on a payment by results basis, just contracting in the ordinary way. Uh, is it choosing the right people and uh, are they doing the job well? And if not, how do you deal with it? And what you do is if it doesn't work very well, you bring on some more people as we have and you tighten the screws on the contractor. 
But if you look back at the long history of contracting in the Ministry of Defence and many other ministries, there is no perfect solution to that. I don't think we have a magic bullet for that or anybody else does. I don't think that's a new feature of the scene in the sense that it's always been the case that government has contracted, will go on contracting in traditional ways for some things. Where it does, it will sometimes get it right, sometimes very right, sometimes wrong, sometimes very wrong. You just have to try and improve all the ones that are wrong. I don't think that's a role of the state issue. I think that's a sort of mechanics of contracting issue. We've got two, two questions, two ladies there. Um, no, the one in front, then back to you. No, 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 yeah, no there. The, the, then, then back Thank to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Julia Cumbridge, I'm uh, a peer in the House of Lords, a Conservative peer. Um, I just want to mention um, that I think that one of the great successes we've had as a nation is, and especially recently, is the emphasis on science and how that well that has been doing. And I think the government's support for the Crick Institute and all that is very, very laudable. I just wonder, um, Oliver, what you feel about the merger that is being proposed between Pfizer and AstraZeneca. <laughs> <laughs> and this comes from a Conservative uh, peer. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I can only tell you that I think the duty of government in that is to be, as George Osborne put it, hard-nosed and to try to get the best possible result for Britain, which is uh, the continuation of our um, uh, huge preeminence in uh, pharmaceutical development and research and manufacture. Um, and that's what the government is trying to do. Um, uh, we have an open economy, um, and it's important that we should, and we've had massive amounts of uh, hugely beneficial inward investment, I think, at the moment running at more than the rest of the European Union together, if I remember the figure correctly. Uh, and w in cases like Jaguar Land Rover uh, and uh, Nissan's production in, in Sunderland, we've seen the transformation of our um, uh, car industry in research, in development, and in manufacture by inward investors. So it can be achieved, but of course you need to achieve that in every case uh, because that's what we want to achieve. Um, it's not just to have the investment, it's to have the investment come in and then produce more research, more development, more jobs, more technology transfer, more competitive leading edge uh, production. That's what we're trying to achieve in that case. Well, we, we've, yes, precisely. We've been, we've been very consciously not, it follows exactly the pattern I was describing, not uh, uh, suddenly appearing with a new welter of regulations, but trying to intervene in an active way to get a, a, a real and enforceable set of measures in place that will benefit this country through research, development, and manufacture. Um, it's a classic case of the way the long-term economic plan rolls out. Hi, Laura Patel from The Times. You told us about the kind of unifying purpose of the coalition and lots of areas where there haven't been rows, but over the last couple of weeks we've seen some really vicious rowing over knife crime and now education, and just wondered if you might try and diagnose what's gone wrong there. Oh. Uh, uh, it's interesting, you, you, you uh, describe these things in an entirely different way from the way that they seem to me. I, 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 s I spend a very large amount of time discussing things with my Liberal Democrat colleagues. Uh, I, I think anybody who had been a participant in those discussions would uh, agree that they have never been in the slightest degree vicious. I don't do vicious, they don't do vicious, we don't believe in vicious, we get on perfectly well, we have sensible discussions. We do indeed disagree about things from time to time. Uh, I don't think that's entirely unprecedented in the history of single party governments. I rather have the impression that the previous administration, which was of a single party, had debates and disputes which might have been more personally charged than ours. Mm -hmm. And uh, we get through uh, our polite and sensible discussions and we come to resolutions and we continue to govern the country. Uh, I have to say, I think the relationships inside our government have been better than at any time that I can recall in the recent political past. Right. There. Uh, Richard Johnson from Public Finance magazine. Uh, quite a lot of the examples that you talked about, Oliver, are kind of voluntary schemes. The neighbourhood planning, um, local communities taking over their libraries is much dependent on the local authority. But can you foresee um, a time when the diseconomies of scale, as you put it, are so obvious that you try and mandate these practices more widely and how that might happen? Well, I, I, you know, my, my personal preference is for 
encouraging rather than mandating. Um, uh, Indeed, I suppose that you could describe what I was describing as the shift, as a shift from government seeing itself as constantly mandating things. It has to mandate some things, but, but it's constantly, endlessly, first base reaching for mandation to a world in which actually government, where it can, tries to encourage and not to mandate. Um, and, uh, and there are all sorts of reasons for that. Um, uh, not least because where people are encouraged to do things instead of mandated to do them, they often do them in a spirit which more nearly achieves what the person who might otherwise have mandated them to do would have hoped to achieve. Um, and I think quite an interesting example of all that is the city deals that uh, my uh, colleagues uh, Nick Clegg and, uh, and Greg Clark have been um, engaged in, or indeed now the local growth deals that are following from them. Um, because those are cases in which as some prominent members of local government present will know, uh, people have come together. Uh, there's, a, there's a challenge, so to speak, there's a, and there's money available from the centre. <coughs> people locally have, have come together to put together their own vision of how to achieve improvements in a whole range of things, you know, um, uh, welfare to work, uh, training, um, uh, the organisation of uh, uh, transport and infrastructure in the cities and so on. Uh, and instead of government either saying, we're out of this, it's your, uh, up to you, or saying, because we're in charge of this, we're going to tell you what to do, government instead says, we, trying to concern ourselves with the interests of the nation as a whole, see that the evolution of cities, uh, development of more powerful and effective economies in the cities, uh, overcoming skill shortage in the cities, and so on, and so on, very important things to do, we don't think we necessarily have the answers. You come and tell us how you'll do it, and we'll give the money to the people who come forward with exciting visions with realistic prospects of success, and you have to put some of your own in too so that we're sure that you're not just spinning us a yarn, you really mean this, and then you get on with it. And I think that combination of intervention from government but at the same time bringing forward um, local enthusiasm has paid enormous dividends. I think it's one of the reasons why, for example, in Greater Manchester you now have a uh, effectively uh, huge degree of cooperation between uh, authorities which, and agencies which previously were hardly talking to one another. We've got time for a couple more questions. Um, Alan there, and then Andrew at the back. And then, yeah. Thank you. Alan Evans, I'm director of the Scotland office and also attached to the Institute for Government as a fellow um, in your attempts to change the role of the state and shrink it in places, which are the areas that have proved most intransigent to change and where have you been most frustrated? Or put it another way, if you'd have known in 2010 what you know now, what would you have done differently to change the role of the state? Well, I, d I wouldn't put it quite in those terms. It, it, I don't think that there is any noticeable... Um, resistance to this general trend. I haven't, I haven't had, I mean, maybe people are just too polite, but I haven't had officials or colleagues or something coming to my office and saying, why are you going in this direction? That, that isn't how it, how it is. I think um, what I would say is that um, it takes a long time to change structures, um, and you have to be awfully patient about it. Um, and I think that's just kind of the nature of the, the thing. Um, uh, uh, democracy and the rule of law have such overwhelming advantages that I think we ought to be willing to tolerate the fact that they do impose some degree of um, uh, uh, process and process in, involves not doing things overnight. Um, but that's kind of the nature of a democracy under the rule of law. I think actually the cases where we've been most frustrated by slowness have not been these sort of cultural shifts. They've been in much more traditional areas. So, for example, we spent a lot of time trying to work out how do you speed up the uh, time between the time you've decided to build a road and the time that the road actually is available for the people who are going to use it, or uh, how do you speed up the amount of time it takes between someone uh, who's running a port seeking permission to dredge it and the time when they've actually done the dredging. You know, those sorts of very sort of boring but incredibly important mechanical things are the things which <coughs> tend to take in Britain a very, very long time. Now, as I say, actually, in a democracy under the rule of law, they will always take longer than they would take if there was some, you know, commissar who could just sort of make them happen. But 
I think we, we need to speed them up, nevertheless, and can speed them up, and have been speeding them up. And that's, that's where more of the frustration about slowness is than in these cultural shifts, which in many cases have been achieved very quickly. I mean, I'm very, very struck, for example, by the speed of transformation in some of these uh, mutuals and voluntary bodies and so on. It's a very, very fast. Um, uh, uh, partly because when you do empower people, um, they quite quickly decide to act. Um, they, 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 in many cases, what, what we found is groups of people who knew what a problem was and would have liked to solve it were parts of systems that were preventing them from solving it. And once you empower them, they say, well, actually, let's just do what we've always thought was sensible to do, and they just do it. That's really quite quick. All right, we've got time for two more there. And Oliver, hi. hi. Um, we've had a chance to talk about this before, so you won't be surprised where I go there. I'm, I'm Christina Dykes. Um, I'm an associate of the um, IFG. And it's on that line I, I want to talk about that most of the examples that you have given from your shift from, from mandation to encouragement involves local government. Um, you, your impression of local government is much more wholesome than mine. And I did a survey of Conservative councillors last year. If you want speed in your transformation, wouldn't it be better to take local government, local councillors with you? At the moment, they have been rather left on the side and have become a hindrance to the transformation that you're seeking. So why no change management for councillors? Why not break, bring councillors in? Because my, after 10 years in local government, the best community activists I know always go into local government. Well, I'm, I'm more optimistic and enthusiastic about this than, than I mean, as, we, as you know, and you are. Uh, and I mean, uh, what, what surprised me actually is, is the extent to which, under the pressure of very considerable public expenditure constraint, um, up and down the country, uh, local governments, and, and that means at least as much councillors as officials, uh, uh, but both, have proved to be amazingly imaginative and, uh, and effective in thinking of ways of getting more for less. Um, uh, often leading the way and showing us in central government how to do it. Um, uh, and I'm very, very struck. You, 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 you'll remember the very long, very acrimonious debates that used to go on about whether uh, uh, we should or shouldn't force councils to amalgamate into unitaries or whatever. And um, uh, what has been happening in the last few years is that quite without any forced amalgamations at all, uh, councils uh, up and down the country have been um, uh, hugely uh, joining up with one another. Uh, in, my, in the case of my own constituency, uh, my local councillors are still there. Uh, and so are the next door local councillors, but actually the council is now one council, effectively. Um, uh, uh, there's one chief executive, one set of directors, one set of senior managers, the whole thing has been put together. And do you know, I, 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 I mean, I, I receive, I don't know, 15,000 letters a year or something. Um, I have not received a single letter from a single constituent complaining about this fact. I don't think they know it's happened. Um, it hasn't affected them. Um, and uh, that's a miraculous achievement. So huge savings have been made, and the population of my constituency uh, don't find any uh, diminution in, in, in the service. In fact, I think it's slightly improved. Um, so you know, that's a very imaginative way to proceed, and, and I think local government done incredibly well. Now, I, of course, I accept that, that there is always scope for all of us involved in administration to improve our act, and I think you know, the work that you've done over the years to try and encourage professionalism amongst councils is an excellent thing to do, but, but I, I'm very optimistic I, I, about uh, local councils and council laws. I think they've been some of the heroes of the last four years. And one final question. Uh, Andrew Jensen from Conservative Home. You, you touched on the paradox that the more successful you are, the less people will notice you. Um, now, were you to be an editor instead of a politician, what would you do about this? How would you get your your journalists to actually give some coverage to what are in fact, if you're correct, very, very important but underestimated <coughs> developments? Um, I have no idea what the answer to that question is. Um, uh, and I, I suspect that it's not doable. Um, 
I suspect that it's not interesting that there should be successes, um, uh, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm not terribly interested in newspapers. But I guess I I if there's any hope, it's through um, having conversations like this in which um, in a slightly less charged atmosphere one discusses these things. And I don't delude myself that I don't, I don't think that the, this generates headlines of you know, great success of neighborhood planning. I can't see, correct me, oh, oh, oh journalists present or editors if there are any. But, you know, <laughs> but I, I doubt that that's going to be a headline any time in the near future. But, but of course the subtext, the way that people describe things, um, you can perhaps to some degree by bringing the attention briefly of journalists to things that have gone right, change the way in which they talk about the things that they are talking about and maybe the public who are after all pretty canny about how to read newspapers and watch TV and so on uh, might pick some of that up. Well Oliver, I, I, one reflection is you may not think newspaper interesting but we have more journalists present tonight at an event than we have at most, uh, uh, m most events. And I, I'm sure also um, you've generated the quote of the week, I don't do vicious. Um, um, and this will, uh, should undoubtedly go into um, uh, 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 in that. More generally, you, you said you were going to disappoint me. You haven't at all. Um, uh, in no way, because you actually discussed very broadly um, changes in the role of the state, um, um, showing both what has happened since 2010 and also p p ways forward. And it's been absolutely fascinating um, hour and a quarter. I'm very grateful for you giving up your time. You. And we hope to welcome you back before the election. So thank on you. behalf of everyone, could you, could you thank Oliver Letwin for what's been absolutely absorbing, as you say, um, measured, measured uh, um, discussion for, for the last period. Thank you. Thank you very much.